Hello everyone and welcome to this great lecture, Local Knowledge, Global Networks, Digital Futures for Higher Education. I'm Lissy Vadekel, Head of Education at British Council Singapore. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we started the great lecture series in Singapore in 2015 and since then have engaged with academics from the UK on a whole range of topics that are of high importance to the UK, to Singapore and indeed globally. The lectures showcase the UK's creativity and innovation with leading specialists presenting their work. This series aligns with British Council's aim of bringing people together to exchange knowledge and skills and to build understanding between the UK and Singapore and all the countries in which we work. And for students in the audience to also help you consider study options that you may not have otherwise thought of. So last year, as most of us had to move much of our work online, we introduced the virtual format to these lectures. This helped us increase our reach beyond the shores of Singapore with part participants signing in from UK as well as from other countries in the region too. Close to 2,700 students, academics, researchers and members of the public joined our lectures in 2021 and also leaving us with very positive feedback about how useful they found these discussions. So now in 2022, as we slowly bounce back from the global pandemic and at least here in Singapore and thankfully in many other countries in the world, we are now seeing some return to, towards normalcy. We aim to continue with the great lectures initially in their virtual format itself, but with the hope that we could have some face to face sessions later in the year. So please keep a lookout for information about future lectures. Now, before we begin in true webinar spirit, uh, may I go over some housekeeping rules, please? Do kindly check that your microphones are on mute, and if not, please mute them now for the whole session until we come to the end where we will have a question answer session where you can interact with our speaker today. Um, likewise, please also turn your video cameras off so that we can conserve bandwidth. Do note that we are recording this session for the benefit of those who could not attend, and we will make this recording available after the lecture. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker, you can type these into the chat box as the lecture is proceeding, and we will try as far as possible to address as many of these as possible uh, when Professor Howard is done with his lecture. Similarly, if you see a question in the chat that you uh, would like the answer to as well, then please click the like button so that will help us to prioritize the more popular questions. Uh, with regards to access, sign language interpretation is being provided throughout the lecture by Barbara, and uh, we will be sharing instructions on how to pin Barbara's video to your screen uh, and also how to turn on the closed captions option if that's helpful to you as well. So now let me hand over to uh, Lucy Watkins, Regional Director, British Council East Asia and Country Director, British Council Singapore, who will introduce our speaker to us today. Lucy, over to you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to all of you who've joined us from the UK today. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture. As Lissy said, over the years from when we began this lecture series in 2015, we've worked with UK universities to put together a brilliant lineup of lectures on various topics from climate change and environmental sustainability to online work, um, autonomous vehicles, cyber security and healthy ageing. And last month we looked at yet another topic of global significance um, and that was plastic pollution. So if you've missed any of these lectures, you'll find the recordings on our web page. Each of these great lectures has taken us on deep dives into subjects which are reshaping so many aspects of our lives today and for the foreseeable future. And undoubtedly, one of these is higher education. Over the course of the last two years, by sheer necessity, most of us have experienced some form of online learning, some version of a digital classroom. Feedback from teachers and learners has been mixed. Some have thoroughly enjoyed the freedom and flexibility afforded by the virtual classroom, and others have struggled with the lack of both, of both connectedness and connectivity. However, with technical, technological advances, we expect that the future of teaching and learning will certainly have a digital element to it. 
which brings us to the topic of today's lecture. On the one hand, we have the standalone lecturer, the sage on the stage. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the we have the we have the massive open online courses or the MOOCs, self-access learning at one's pace, available anytime, anywhere. However, we're now seeing a transformative shift with researchers, museum curators, multimedia experts and educationalists coming together to assemble and interlink state of the art digital teaching resources that could be deployed at every educational level from elementary school to postgraduate. And the University of Oxford, with its unique combination of a world class academic community, unrivaled library and museum collections and state of the art information technology is placing itself at the epicentre of this process. To tell us more, we're delighted to have, a, have with us today Professor Howard Hodson from the University of Oxford. Professor Hodson is Professor of Early Modern Intellectual History at the University of Oxford and Academic Director of Digital Scholarship at Oxford. Professor Howard Hodson completed his bachelor's and master's at the University of Toronto, followed by his do doctorate at Corpus Christi College, Oxford. He then held various research fellowship positions, including at Oxford, UCLA and the British Academy. He taught at the University of Aberdeen before joining St Anne's College, Oxford in 2005. Professor Hodgson's teaching interests ranged throughout the early modern period, including the Renaissance, Reformation and early modern art, science and technology in European and global contexts. His recent research interests include the application of digital technology to teaching and learning. He's one of the architects of the Cabinet Project in Oxford, which is developing digital infrastructure for teaching with objects and images. Professor Hodgson, we're delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking time to de deliver this lecture for our audience. And now over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, above all to the British Council in Singapore for the opportunity to share some fresh thoughts with uh, an audience on the other side of the world and potentially globally as well. Now, historians like me study the past and uh, the audience may find themselves wondering, uh, therefore, what business a historian has giving glimpses of the future. And to that question, I would respond that I'm an intellectual historian. What does that mean? It means that I study past intellectual activity, the history of science, technology, uh, culture, um, art, uh, um, tech, uh, in its deeper historical context. That is to say, the educational institutions and practices which sustain uh, intellectual activity over the generations and the deeper cultural values uh, which in turn sustain those institutions. And it turns out that this uh, background provides us with some fresh perspectives on the traditional practices of the university and how they might be transformed by the historically uh, significant ongoing revolution in communication technology. So I'd like to begin by looking backward historically at the most central of the teaching practices of the traditional university, namely the lecture, and then look forward uh, to some of the means of enhancing and transforming it, which are becoming available today. And I'll do so under the title, Local Knowledge, Global Networks, Digital Futures for Higher Education. This is a lecture about how digital technology can enhance and transform traditional modes of teaching, like the lecture. So we thought we would experiment a little bit with departing from the standard lecture format in pursuit of something a little bit more experimental. So let's begin by thinking a bit about the lecture itself. Here you have an image of a university lecture from over 600 years ago, from the oldest university in Europe, the University of Bologna, sometime before 1400. The clothing has changed, but the basic configuration of the room and the activity being conducted within it is strikingly familiar. The lecturer sits on a raised platform where he can be seen and heard by the rows of auditors on benches before and beside him. Students listen and take notes, or at least most of them do. If you look closely, in the upper right-hand corner, two students are chatting with one another. Another rests his cheek on his hand as if he's struggling to stay awake. And in the bottom right-hand corner, another student has given up the struggle altogether and fallen sound asleep. So if you've ever fallen asleep in the back of a lecture theater, then you're part of an ancient academic tradition going back at least to the 14th century. 
So let's think a bit more about what's going on in this image. What exactly is a lecture? Well, the English noun lecture derives by the French from the Latin lectura and ultimately from the verb legere, which means to, to read. So a lecture literally is a reading. The lecturer or reader, as he was also sometimes called, did not merely read the text in front of him. He offered a running commentary or gloss on specific points of interest or difficulty, which the students in front of them noted down in the in the books in front of them. So this brings us to the key point. The lecture in its pure form is a cycle of teaching and learning that is entirely verbal. The lecturer reads from the written text. He then speaks what he reads, adding his verbal commentary on the text. His audience, and again, the word comes from the Latin audientia, from audire to hear, his audience is listeners listen to what he says, they write down the essence of what he's saying, thereby producing a written document which could become the basis of a further lecture when they rise in academic standing. So you have a, a cycle here of writing, reading, speaking, and listening, which is entirely verbal in nature. And this is why for centuries learning was so strongly associated with letters and why education was so strongly associated with literacy, the capacity to read. Education is the process of reproducing knowledge from one generation to another. And the standardized characters known as letters are far easier to reproduce and transmit accurately than the infinite variety of other objects of experience. So letters and verbal learning have been absolutely central to the educational tradition going right back to the foundation of the medieval universities 800 years ago. So how has this central university institution, the lecture, changed over the last 500 years in response to wave after wave of technological innovation? Typography greatly improved the accuracy and efficiency with which written text could be reproduced and transmitted. It greatly expanded the range of reading material av available. Um, and this eventually emancipated the lecturer from the literal reading of a single authoritative text, which was the standard practice in the medieval university. By the mid 17th century, the period I study actually, professors were composing their lectures from a range of different sources interspersed with their own views. So this is something much more like the modern lecture, which is not a reading of a prescribed authority. It is the, the professor, the lecturer, the reader, providing his own synthesis of a much uh, um, richer uh, body of material. But movable type was still about letters and texts, and the lecture was still overwhelmingly a verbal uh, process of transmission. Now, along with uh, printing with movable type, um, the woodblock printing and eventually copper engravings were also introduced. The capacity to uh, reproduce complex uh, and, and intricate illustrations um, in, uh, in mass production transformed uh, many of the empirical disciplines. Anatomy, botany, zoology, cartography, architecture, one could go on and on. But these illustrations were still very, very expensive, far too expensive for student use. And moreover, there was no means of projecting them in the lecture theater. So what I'm saying is here is this, these enormous communications revolutions of typography on the one hand, of engraving on the other, did not transform the nature of the university lecture in any really palpable way. At least not as a process of essentially verbal transmission from one generation to another. Of course, from the 16th century onwards, experiments were undertaken in, the, in, in attempting to project images within, in front of an audience. So um, already in the 16th century, for instance, magic lantern slides uh, were, um, were used. And by the 19th century, electric light provided the possibility to project these images in front of large audiences, particularly when combined with photography, this kind of projection became one of the major forms of entertainment in the latter 19th and early 20th century. But again, this technology is too cumbersome, is too complicated for 
for everyday use in the classroom. Perhaps more surprisingly, the same really applies to cinema. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, you see a progressive revolution in, uh, in the moving picture. Rise of the film industry in the 1910s, the synchronized sound and vision in the, in the 1920s, the breakthrough of color in the 1930s, uh, television in the 1940s and 50s. I mean, obviously, these have uh, transformed enter entertainment in all kinds of ways. But again, they're too cumbersome uh, to be used for any more than special occasions within the classroom, within the university lecture theater. So we're talking about a 500-year period in which um, uh, uh, both print technology and visual projection technology has gradually moved forward has had very little impact on the standard mode of transmission within the university, the lecture, which is why this image from the 14th century still looks so current today. It's really only within a very brief period in the last couple of decades where the capacity to project high quality images in the lecture theater has been possible for the first time. And I think here particularly of, of PowerPoint presentations. When I began lecturing, it was the standard way of projecting an image on a screen, a piece of acetate with photocopied image on it, which you placed on a, on a, uh, on a screen, and it was, it was mirrored up into the, into the screen. So even when PowerPoint comes on stream in the late 80s, it's, it's still being used in this today very antiquated technology. So the real power of PowerPoint, it seems to me, is to reproduce images, including graphics. Um, and combined with a data projector, they make it extremely easy to introduce visual material into the lecture theater for the first time in 800 years. But as a means of shifting the focus of education from words alone to words and things, the PowerPoint presentation remains inadequate for several reasons. They're typically evanescent. That is to say, they disappear after the lecturer. No one would imagine giving students a text only available for a few instants on a PowerPoint presentation, but this is what we do with images all the time. Moreover, they don't point beyond themselves. Uh, uh, an image may point beyond itself, but the image which is only projected on the, on the screen for a few moments during a lecture is self-contained. They lack commentary, patiently explaining in detail uh, what you're looking at and what its significance is, and they're self-contained. They're not embedded within networks of learning materials. They don't reach out beyond the lecture itself in any very effective way. And so this is essentially the, the, the situation in which we found ourselves in, tw in, in February 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic forced lecturers, uh, whether they wanted to or not, to innovate with the use of digital technology for delivering lecture material um, uh, on a global scale. Now, obviously, there were huge advantages to that, the most important being it was safe. There's no threat of contagion if people are not actually in the same room. It turns out to be very convenient. One doesn't need to travel in order to um, give a lecture or indeed to converse with people. It's very efficient, different people in different places, different people in different times can participate in the same lecture, but it also has serious disadvantages. Um, online learning is less personal, it's less intimate, less interactive, less social, less engaging. Now the key point for my present purposes is a slightly different one, namely that we fail to grasp the most important transformational aspect of digital technology namely the capacity to escape from the age-old necessity of channeling our learning almost entirely through spoken, written, and printed words. So what happens if we break out of the lecture in the strict sense of the term in the broader educational tradition in which material is tr transmitted exclusively by the word, printed, written, and spoken? The interesting thing is that in doing so, we also potentially break out of the dominance of the lecturer as a sole authority with the necessity of packaging up the whole of the subject in a single-handed manner and transmitting it to the audience. Instead of the lone lecturer, in the near future, I believe we will see new generations of educational materials being created by international and interdisciplinary consortia of academic researchers, museum curators, 
potentially multimedia experts and, and educational specialists. Instead of mere lectures in the literal sense, these materials will consist of multimedia educational resources, both harvested, ready-made from across the internet and created from scratch for very specific topics. Instead of being produced only by well-funded teams in elite institutions, which used to be required for the, for the creation of any kind of video or multimedia uh, material, these materials can be assembled by just about anyone who can combine academic expertise in the subject in question with an educational flair in communicating it at the relevant educational level. And instead of serving only elite institutions, these resources can be put to the use of uh, every educational level, uh, wherever it might happen to be, from elementary school to taught postgraduate. So we're not talking about tomorrow's technology for the most part. We're talking about technology which is already well consolidated um, and, and, and easily accessible. The capacity we need is the capacity to reproduce visual materials, including very high resolution visual materials already available on the internet. The capacity to create multimedia learning experience with a facility unimaginable only a decade ago. The capacity to collaborate via the internet, and, and again, in a way that was literally unthinkable uh, until very recently. And the capacity to make these materials instantly accessible everywhere via the internet which has transformed the possibility of communication in the past couple of decades. Museums, libraries, educational institutions around the world are publishing digital images of their collections in vast quantities, many of them open access and licensed for reuse for educational purposes free of charge. Heritage organizations are also making available high quality images of landscapes, cityscapes, buildings, and other large scale heritage uh, uh, resources. 3D photogrammetry and augmented reality now provide opportunities to handle three-dimensional objects in a manner which surpasses in some respects the actual engagement with these objects in the museum where of course they're always out of reach behind glass. Educational videos and other interactive uh, digital learning resources are likewise proliferating on the internet, the best of which provide brief and highly effective introductions to complex subjects. Um, very difficult to grasp in purely technical, uh, textual uh, uh, modes of, uh, of teaching. So the next generation of educational materials, it seems to me, will be created by harvesting these existing materials, supplementing them with additional purpose-made content for specific topics, interlinking them with one another in multiple pathways, and providing them with appropriate commentary and annotations, which are kind of the glue which holds the whole thing together. Now, this is not, of course, a purely digital enterprise. Expert, academic guidance is still needed for every stage of this process. Academic expertise is needed to provide the commentary and, and annotation required to make the significance of individual objects and clusters of objects uh, clear to students at many different educational levels. Now, Oxford, it turns out, is a, an excellent laboratory for beginning the process of experimenting in the development of this new generation of educational materials. The university provides an excellent environment in which to pilot the development of such resources by bringing together five key components. One, of course, is a world-class academic community. Another is a magnificent collection of universities, uh, university museums and libraries, which have accumulated over the past 800 years that the university has been in existence. A third crucial component is cutting edge digital technology. Uh, a fourth is specialist expertise in education uh, at, all, uh, at all levels. And the fifth is the fact that the university provides an excellent platform from which to coordinate broader intercollegiate collaboration. And in fact, if we wanted to add a sixth important component, we can also access expertise on the business models needed to make an a, a, a educational experiment capable of, of exponential growth financially viable uh, at this scale. 
So what might the framework for this new generation of educational materials look like? At this point, I'd like to show you what might be regarded as an advanced prototype exploring what the framework or infrastructure for serving the next generation of lecturers might look like. And I'll stress again here that this is not actually high tech, and, and, and perhaps that's its a crucial strength. We're dealing with tried and tested technology, which has simply not previously been put to educational use. Now, the easiest way for me to um, expound the way in which the platform that we've developed has, has originated is perhaps to ground the, the, the narrative in my own teaching. Um, I teach, amongst other things, the history of 17th century science, the period of the scientific revolution. And when I started teaching in Oxford, we were teaching largely via texts like everyone else. We read Francis Bacon, we read Rene Descartes, we read Galileo, we read Newton, and so on. But I found this increasingly frustrating for a number of reasons. Most fundamentally, perhaps, this period, the 17th century, is a period in which European science turned decisively from words to things, from the study of the great text of classical antiquity, characteristic of the Renaissance, to the direct empirical observation of the natural world. And of course, also, when new instruments were invented, like the telescope and the microscope, to insist the senses in this new mode of inquiry. And new processes were de uh, developed as well. Uh, experimental engagement with the natural world. This is the period when new facilities were established in and outside the university. Uh, botanical gardens, anatomical theaters, museum collections. And in fact, Oxford possesses many of these, but we were not in a, in a position to in integrate them fully into our teaching. So it's increasingly frustrating to teach this material overwhelmingly from texts. And what we needed was a digital platform for teaching with objects and images alongside the texts. So what we needed was a digital platform for teaching with objects and images as well as texts. Now we've called this system cabinet, um, and that's because it's, a, it's inspired by the cabinets of curiosities, which were such a striking feature of the sort of intellectual culture of Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. This was a period where, where Europe was being flooded with all kinds of, um, of, of outlandish and, and unheard of natural historical specimens and also artisanal artifacts from all over the world as Europe was connected with the rest of the world for the first time. And this, this profoundly stimulated the, um, the emotion of curiosity and really transformed it from a vice into a virtue, something which stimulated uh, uh, new kinds of learning going forward. And that's exactly the kind of um, attitude that we want to stimulate in students. So here you have um, the sort of basic page identifying the components of this course on 17th century science that I was talking about. And as you can see, it's, um, it's organized in terms of an Oxford University uh, um, history course. There are eight classes for each of the eight weeks of the term, and there are four tutorials. Uh, on which students write uh, individual essays. And if you click on any one of these uh, individual topics, you get a further uh, structure of uh, more specific topics underneath that. If you click on any one of those, then you're provided with a well-organized um, uh, display of the specific objects that you need to study. And if you click on any one of those objects, then you are drilling down into the actual um, uh, images themselves and the commentary on them. And this is the kind of page which uh, turns up at that point. You can see the image at the top of the page, commentary on it below. In this case, it's an image which is annotated. We can annotate the images and then link out from those annotations to other resources on, 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 the, uh, on the system, including um, very high resolution uh, um, two-dimensional images, which in many cases have simply been harvested from uh, pre-existing material on the internet, and also linking through to a surprising variety of other pre-existing resources like this three-dimensional panorama of the interior of um, the Divinity School in Oxford, that is to say the medieval uh, chamber for teaching theology, the queen of the sciences uh, in the 15th century. Um, 
Likewise, we can embed three-dimensional visualizations uh, on the system. And here you have another particularly striking example of an of a object from the Ashmolean University Museum of, of Art and, and Antiquities. And as you can see, as you move the object around, the annotations stay in the relevant place on the image. So again, we can not only manipulate, but also uh, annotate uh, three-dimensional objects as well. Um, here's another example of the sort of functionality which allows us to bring together genuinely multimedia packages of uh, learning materials. This is an armillary sphere. An armillary sphere is an absolutely standard instrument for understanding and for calculating the uh, motions of the heavenly bodies uh, throughout the medieval period into the early modern period. This is fundamental for understanding early modern astronomy, but it's not an easy thing to grasp the significance of if all that you have is a textual description, or indeed a, a static two-dimensional image. But here we have uh, um, an example of the sort of pre-existing uh, videos which are already available on the internet, in this case created by the History of Science Museum in Oxford, which provide a much easier access for students to understand what this instrument is designed to do, uh, how it works, what its broader significance is. So these are examples of the kind of um, uh, functionality which allows us to bring together from existing material and bespoke uh, newly created material these multimedia learning packages. And the other point to stress here is the steadily expanding, expanding variety of, of uses to which this uh, technology can be put. So here, for instance, we have what is effectively a research monograph. A research monograph explaining, in this case, how material from the Oxford Botanical Garden passed through the Oxford, Oxford Herbaria, that is to say the collection of dried uh, plant specimens in the 17th century, to create the first great scientific publication published by the Oxford University Press in the latter 17th century. Here you have a more typical use case, an undergraduate paper, in this case using objects from the Ashmolean uh, to, to introduce material culture into the, into the study of 18th century uh, literature, bringing alive all kinds of aspects of the literature, which is otherwise difficult for students to, to, uh, to appreciate. Um, obviously, university lecturers are using this, but again, one of the most striking uh, um, developments is to see how useful participation in this project is to early stage researchers. For instance, here we have material of a doctoral student of mine who began in his very first term in Oxford to populate Ox to cabinet with material from his own doctoral dissertation, um, allowing him to demonstrate the very beginning of his academic career, the relevance of his specialist research to um, curricular subjects, in this case, uh, at the first year university level. In fact, my own undergraduates have been contributing material as well, which they they uh, write, some of them engaging closely with the kind of um, uh, visual and material sources and um, coming up with fresh and interesting insights which really need to be captured for the use of uh, subsequent generations of students. Likewise, um, reaching outside the university, here we have an example of cabinet use for public engagement. Um, a whole consortium of scholars, not only in Oxford, but outside in the Sorbonne, in other British universities, in Berlin, and so on, uh, trying to put Soviet Central Asia on the map with that wonderful formula uh, of uh, uh, depicting this historical topic with 100, uh, 100 objects illustrating many different dimensions of, uh, of the phenomenon. We've been using it for museum exhibitions as well, and this is another really interesting development. Cabinet is largely about bringing the museum into the classroom, but we also want to bring the classroom back into the museum. And here we have a mobile ready apps which allow, um, which allow museum visitors to generate three-dimensional objects, uh, three-dimensional models of the objects which are uh, inaccessible to them behind the glass, and also then to tap into the more detailed um, uh, commentary on some of those objects which is already on cabinet. So that's just uh, a, a few of the um, use cases which are constantly proliferating for the use of this technology, both in and outside uh, the university itself.
Okay, so let's step back a little bit from the details of functionality and use cases and consider a little bit the, the general characteristics of this platform that we're developing. Cabinet provides a platform on which whole communities of scholars can collaborate in assembling, interlinking, explicating, gradually evolving bodies of material on any subject. In other words, Cabinet is more like a mosaic than a monolith. Materials on Cabinet are highly granular. It's composed out of many small pieces. And there are many beneficial consequences of this. For one thing, courses or indeed individual lectures on Cabinet don't need to be designed to the last detail at the outset or built in one go by a compact team under a single presiding genius or packaged up in final inalterable form. They can, be collect they can be collaboratively generated and they can be flexible and capable of continuous evolution. Disciplines evolve constantly. Our understanding of individual major themes and topics evolve constantly, driven forward by new discoveries and fresh debates. This, this uh, constant evolution cannot be accommodated within more monolithic educational uh, uh, packages. But this flexible, granular, infinitely editable, interlinked material range in multiple pathways accommodates constant revision uh, and development. I think maybe even more interestingly is the fact that cabinet materials are non-linear. Verbal learning is a sec effectively linear. One word follows another in a fixed sequence, whether in spoken discourse or written text, because of grammar, because of syntax, because of the nature of language itself. But visual learning is non-linear. Images and objects don't need to follow one another in a fixed sequence. Their meaning does not rely on syntax, on their place within the grammar of a sentence. It's far easier to leap from one object or image to many other uh, objects or images in no particular fixed order. So the appropriate technology here is not typography, but the graph. In fact, images are the perfect objects to populate the knowledge graph because any image can relate to any number of other images in a huge number of meaningful ways. Now, for all these reasons, Collaboration can also replace the lone lecturer in generating all of this material. This is partly because image-based learning helps us break out of these kind of structures um, and into a whole network of educators much more effectively. And this is where the title uh, Local Knowledge and Global Networks comes in. My own knowledge history is, sorry, my own discipline history is going global. We and our students now need to know about people, places, and times which were previously marginal to the curriculum. How on earth are we going to equip ourselves with material needed to teach this broadened curriculum? One possibility, for instance, comes from uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and machine learning. Imagine a whole ocean of carefully curated material of the kind I've been describing and pathways through it curated by experts for specific educational purposes. At this point, additional pathways can be plotted by machine learning and artificial intelligence based on all kinds of parameters like the color, the size, the shape, the material of objects, the type, the place of origin, the time of creation, and all kinds of other associations. So one can imagine curated pathways by, by um, uh, academic experts supplemented by an almost infinity of uh, pathways linking networks of association, linking these objects with one another generated by a AI and machine learning. Another higher technology uh, possibility comes from immersive technologies. Imagine, for instance, bringing together on a regular basis handfuls of specialists on a very particular subject scattered around the globe. This is where we begin to see the best of both worlds, not sacrificing the intimacy, the very direct uh, interpersonal relationship of people in a confined space focused on the same object um, in order to uh, reach out beyond uh, any particular locality and network uh, further with people around the globe, wherever they may happen to be. Whatever we are doing now, in other words, it's transitional. Now let me conclude with a few disclaimers. I do not, of course, foresee the end of residential higher education. Oxford, with its ancient system of colleges, is as deeply committed to teaching students residing on site as any university in the world. I also don't foresee the end of the intimate tutorial 
involving one tutor and two or three students in, you know, in a confined space. Nor would I want to see the end of actual handling sessions, those rare opportunities which students have to actually handle physical museum objects, obviously in a tightly con controlled setting. Still less do I see the end of the lecture as an as a, as a enriched and enhanced experience. In fact, I find personally that lecturing over a well-worked body of material on cabinet solves beautifully a dilemma that I've always felt as a lecturer. So to conclude, we are very much still in the process of coming into possession of incomparably the most powerful communication technology the world has ever known. Education is all about communication. The university, I like to say, is one of the most successful pieces of information technology ever invented. The challenge, therefore, is to adapt, to reinvent key aspects of the university in order to harness the benefits of this new mode of communication to the core mission of the university while using them to enhance and preserve all that's best about traditional academic practice. The challenge is not so much technological. We have the technology. It's cultural and economic. If we can adapt existing practices and forge the new relationships needed to use this technology effectively, we can help take education into a new era and to realize some of the brighter futures for higher education in the next few years. That's a glimpse into possible futures in the development of educational technology from a university teacher. But of course, the purpose of all this is to serve the needs of the next generation of students. So what we'd like to do now is open the floor up to um, questions from students, beginning with a couple of them here uh, in the audience today. In thinking about just how um, flexible and how visual this tool is, what about the very young students, the secondary school students? How can they use Cabinet to sharpen their interests, explore, but also follow their own secondary school curriculum? Yeah, you know, this is a, a project which has been sort of born and bred at the university level, but the more um, questions like this we feel the clearer it becomes the same principles can be adapted to school. I, I think um, today's students are visual learners. Um, they respond to images because they've been, they've, been, uh, uh, they've been confronted with them in much greater quantity than previous generations. I think today's students are nonlinear as well. They, they're graph learners. They, they connect everything with everything. Um, and, and they're active learners. They like to be provided with multiple options at every stage of their, of their learning experience. Um, obviously, in order to adapt this material for, for school use, we need to collaborate with experts in education who understand how to communicate with younger uh, children much more effectively than we do at the university level. So, so this adds a whole other level of, of collaboration to the project. Um, but the really intriguing thing is to use uh, material designed for school students to also help them um, overcome this barrier between uh, school and university. There's a real problem in this country and many others of uh, students being intimidated from applying uh, to the best universities in the country by this notion that they're, that they're inaccessible to ordinary people. And if able students from whatever background find themselves working with uh, highly stimulating and interesting educational materials born and bred in a university like Oxford and linked through to university level material, which they can also begin to study and find stimulating and interesting, we like to think that it will encourage them to think that those kind of institutions, university institutions, are places where they could also thrive. And that would be a whole other contribution of this technology to uh, overcoming one of the major educational challenges of the moment. Yeah, also, I guess, moving on to tertiary education, undergraduate students become like these central figures who can enjoy the benefits of uh, this kind of technology. So what kind of feedback do you get from undergraduate students and what kind of experiences um, do they mostly get out of cabinet? 
Well, I interestingly, the, the, um, the, the sort of focus groups that we've had to date have been very encouraging in that regard. You know, you put a microphone in, in front of them, you encourage them to talk, and they say very much the sort of things that you, you'd hope them to. Um, they find um, visual learning highly attractive. Um, typically, the historians that I teach have been taught to associate an historical source with a historical text. They've been taught to read texts. They haven't been taught to read images, but it's a kind of an emancipation for them to develop that capacity to read and interrogate an image. And they feel, uh, they, they say that they feel that this is fresh territory for them. This is not something that has already been picked over endlessly by previous generations of students or something fresh and interesting to say. But the other thing that they, I think they particularly appreciate about Cabinet is that you can take these very rich multimedia packages, linking out to videos, linking out to 3D visualizations, linking out to material on and off Cabinet itself, uh, creating curricula composed of many, many different objects and images, but you package it together in a really coherent way where they always know where they are. It's very useful for them preparing for a lecture or a tutorial, actually in the lecture and tutorial. Sometimes we teach directly from cabinet and also for revisions for examination. So you can, you can enrich the body of material that they're studying without disorientating them or without requiring them to spend most of their time going from library to library looking for the books that they need in order. So, so this is one of the features of, uh, of this kind of material which, which undergraduate students particularly enjoy. But we'd be also very interested to um, field some questions from um, students and others uh, in the broader audience. And that's what we're going to do in the final section of this session. Thank you so much, Professor Hodson, for that fantastic lecture. A very interesting glimpse into what the future of the classroom, the lecture theater, uh, could look like. Um, I'd, I'd now like to open up the session for uh, the Q&A. So if anyone in the audience has a question for Professor Hodson, um, please unmute yourself and you can post that question directly to him. Uh, but in the meantime, Professor Hodson, there's a question that's come through from Charles in the chat, and I'll just pose that to you if you could just respond to that, please. So Charles's question is regarding future historians. What is the impact of artifact evanescence on the retrospective study of pedagogical and intellectual exchange? That's a very interesting question. Um... I think the point that I was making is that what's particularly evanescent, that is to say transient, uh, which disappears and is inaccessible to the historian, is the spoken word, which is the primary medium of um, academic communication over hundreds and hundreds of years. That's the thing that we that we can no longer, um, uh, you know, reaccess uh, and study. Um, even the context in which that spoken word was transacted is surprisingly. Uh, poorly uh, preserved. I mean, there are very few uh, extant lecture theaters furnished as they might have been several hundred years ago uh, in which we can reconstruct the sort of academic practices which, which took place. What is preserved from the past and maybe preserved for the future from the present is written uh, and perhaps also recorded um, uh, writings or uh, or videos or whatever of uh, of academic lectures. I think in some respects, our current technology is more evanescent than the older technology, precisely in the sense that you know, the platforms on which a recording may sit are rendered obsolete so quickly, unlike you know a, a manuscript, which if it's kept in the right conditions can be preserved for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, arguably the most um, uh, robust uh, and, and best preserved material is precisely the, the artifacts, um, which can outlive, you know, both fragile paper materials, um, uh, uh, evanescent uh, digital materials, uh, and of course, all the uh, verbal uh, discussions as well, much better than anything else. Um, but we, can, but we haven't had an opportunity to integrate those artifacts into our teaching with anything like the facility that we have going forward. So hopefully, as we package up the very best of 21st century education materials, you'll have, you'll have classic packages uh, of such um, improved 
pedagogical utility that, uh, that the best of current practice will be preserved and provide future historians with plenty to study about how we have responded to this challenge and this opportunity, which is, which is unfolding all around us uh, in the current day. Thank you, Professor Hudson. I would like to ask you a question, actually. Um, so you mentioned that the technology is available there, so it's not a question of that. Uh, but you also mentioned about the financial viability of, you know, e expanding this and taking it outside of Oxford and outside of the uh, cabinet project that you're talking about as well. So how do you see this, this sort of, you know, advancement? How do you see this? something like cabinet then expanding beyond Oxford and coming to, let's say, Singapore or or uh, this region, Asia. How, how's that collaboration? How do you see that happening? Where's the financial impetus going to come from? Where's the technological expertise going to come from as well? Like I could see a lot of, you know, yeah, this is going to be what the future is, but there's so many um, uh, variables that we need to be considering on that as well. So what's your take on that? Well, my my starting point would be that the technology is is already established. I mean, I think one of the strengths of this project is it doesn't require any kind of hugely uh, ambitious technological innovation, at least not for the core of what I've been proposing here. Um, it requires a culture shift to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, academics need to begin considering that there might be better ways of assembling material for lectures collectively um, and introducing a much more sort of collaborative uh, approach into generating state-of-the-art educational materials with something like the same kind of effort we put into state-of-the-art research materials. Okay, we publish all the time, but we don't publish material that's coming out of our teaching practice as, as opposed to our research practice. That requires a cultural shift, which also may require institutional adjustments. I mean, for one thing, seeing um, uh, universities less competing with one another than collaborating okay. with Another to raise to raise the bar. The real problem, I think, becomes when you consider that this kind of approach could be rolled out across all the disciplines of the university, sort of on a worldwide basis. At that point, you're talking about the the the, the need for exponential growth, the need for scaling this kind of thing up uh, at a rate which um, really exceeds the capacity of of individual universities to finance it. You know, because if you're reaching out beyond an individual institution to collect the material, but then I think even more importantly, beyond an individual institution to sort of propagate that material, and maybe not just at the university level, but also at the school level, you know, you're taking on a mission which goes well beyond um, the mission of, a, of an individual institution and requires financial resources, which an individual institution is not going to be able to, um, to uh, provide. Now, this gets us into a really interesting domain, which is completely unfamiliar to a ordinary practicing uh, academic like myself, because of course there are gigantic uh, um, uh, enterprises out there all about uh, communicating at a global scale and, and developing information and communication technology at an extremely rapid pace. And as we all know, uh, you know, this is one of the most uh, lucrative, profitable, uh, growth industries, you know, in the world at the moment. So, so the question then may become how to tap into some of the resources, financial and otherwise, of that gigantic industry while preserving the um, the creative, generative potential of academic culture, where people exchange the best of uh, their material, whether from the research side or from the teaching side, um, you know for the public benefit, for with the expectation that what has been freely given will be freely passed on uh, to people uh, wherever they may happen to be. So there's a very interesting uh, uh, problem to be uh, resolved there, generating the finance necessary to sustain, um, you know, potentially exponential growth of this kind of technology, while also sustaining the kind of values which generate the, the academic content. Um, so I don't have a, 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 a easy answer to your question, but I, I would say this is something on which um, a lot of uh, attention and I, I think also ingenuity are going to be invested uh, in the very near future. And and you you raised that point that was going through my head as well, Prof Hudson, about that uh, moving away from that competition 
and going into that collaboration, freely sharing and freely passing on. We are a ways away from uh, reaching that perfect state, but I think you know there is potential to get there. Um, digital, technology, us- digital technology, digital um, technology uh, is perfect for that, right? Right, because it is the first technology ever created, which allows everyone to communicate with everyone in this kind of free and open way. So it's mm-hmm. almost like the, the, the technology is leading us in that direction. We need to find uh, the institutional arrangements to, to seize that opportunity. And uh, would you be able to share, uh, Professor Hodson, how Cabinet is looking forward to that collaboration? You know, what do you have in the pipeline? Well, um, I could give you one instance which is actually quite central to the work that we're doing at the moment, which which I didn't actually touch on uh, in the lecture. Um, And this is not only creating educational resources at every level of the sort of of university teaching, including including taught postgraduate and research monographs and this kind of thing, but also beginning to relate that to uh, pre-university teaching uh, perhaps in secondary school in the first instance, and then and then uh, 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 at the earlier educational levels. This is potentially an extremely exciting uh, for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is that um, having created a new generation of educational materials at the university level, we can filter some of that down to the secondary school level in a way that enhances the educational experience, the learning experiences of Uh, of students um, prior to university. And also, we would hope, helps encourage students from what one might call unconventional backgrounds, backgrounds where they're not traditionally uh, uh, recruiting into universities and uh, particularly elite universities, having, having encountered in their secondary schooling a new generation of educational materials born and bred in universities like mine, um, uh, which they find more stimulating, they, they find more engaging, uh, um, a more awakening of their curiosity, their desire to learn more, um, not only enhancing their education at the secondary school level, but also raising their aspirations and, and, uh, uh, and, and giving them the idea that, um, that maybe university is uh, the right place for them. Maybe this is an environment in which they can thrive. Maybe despite what they hear about universities being elitist institutions and uh, inaccessible to ordinary uh, ordinary mortals, um, that, that they could thrive in that environment. And therefore, increasing the capacity of, of universities like mine to recruit something more like a typical cross-section uh, of the general population. I think that's a very exciting and interesting new possibility that we will be pursuing very uh, energetically uh, in, in, in coming months. And a very promising future to look forward to then. Uh, thank you, Professor Hodson. I'm afraid that's all that we have the time for today. To students out there, to parents and academics in the audience, I'm sure this session has given you uh, a very interesting glimpse into what the future of higher education and indeed Uh, pre-university education might look like. So on behalf of the British Council, I would like to thank Professor Hodson for all the insights he's given us today into uh, how digital technology is is leading the way to help transform the way in which we teach and learn in the future. Uh, I would also like to thank the Singapore Association for the Deaf and Barbara, thank you for your interpretation today. We are very proud to be working with SADEF on all these lectures and we look forward to working with you again. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us at this great lecture. Now, just before we close, I have one last last task for you. Um, We've created a survey form and we'd really appreciate your feedback uh, on how you found today's lecture. So please do complete this form for us. We'll put the uh, link in the chat right now. It'll take you two minutes to get this done. And you'll also find a recording of this lecture, as Lucy mentioned earlier on, on our web page, including all the other lectures that we've done uh, over these years now. So the link is in the chat. Please do um, help us with your feedback. And we'll also put in the link to, yes, that's it, the, the web page where you can find previous great lectures and then the recording of this lecture in a couple of days time will also be at the same web page. So thank you again, Professor Hodson. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Have a good day and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.